The Tom Ridge Environmental Center is a host to a variety of government and nonprofit organizations, including the Regional Science Consortium. The Regional Science Consortium is a collaborative nonprofit organization that focuses on and coordinates educational research projects for Lake Erie and the Upper Ohio River Basin. The Regional Science Consortium offers field courses throughout the year on a multitude of topics, from algae to birds, fish, plants, and conservation. Students of all ages come for college credit or just for the love of learning. My name is Rachel Cleaver and I'm taking this class to gain better knowledge of the biodiversity of the streams of Pennsylvania and to really get a knowledge for what's there. The consortium provides the opportunity and the resources to further knowledge with research and opportunities that you couldn't get some other places. They have the equipment and the space to use it with. So. It's going to really help develop research and to really gain knowledge and know what's out there so that they can be cautious of it and know what they're dealing with. Water testing at Presque Isle informs the public of the health of our beaches. When beach water is tested, scientists look for Escherichia coli. High E. coli counts result in a swimming advisory. Exposure to these contamination levels may cause flu-like symptoms. Nicole Finney researched two components of water testing. Can we predict beach closings using known data from previous years? And if results are affected by sample gathering location or depth? Nicole gathered three samples per site, each at differing depths. Once in the lab, two dilutions of each sample were run through a vacuum filtration system. While the traditional method of water testing is still the standard, a new faster method is being developed. Dr. Steve Morrow from Mercyhurst College uses DNA analysis to search for different pathogens in our beach water. While we do not know the safe range using the DNA-based technique, the goal of this study is to correlate the presence of various pathogenic genes to existing E. coli levels. The culmination will result in establishing guidelines for the DNA analysis of our beaches. While this sounds trivial, DNA analysis gives us much faster results. Beach advisories can be posted the same day rather than 24 hours after the water is found to have potentially pathogenic organisms. In the lab, water is passed through a filter that will catch any present bacteria. The filter is then boiled, which releases the DNA from the trapped bacteria. The genetic material is then isolated from other cellular debris, and specified genetic sequences are retained. These genes are then multiplied by a process called amplification. At the same time, this process also measures the amount of amplified DNA in the sample, and we then know of the relative abundance of these organisms in our beach water. This week, I had the pleasure of conducting a class in the Monoc wetland monocots of Presque Isle. I, mean, I really applaud this park for, since 96, taking the initiative to maintain existing high-quality wetlands, but also their efforts to restore sites that we knew were great maybe 10 or 15 years ago that have been completely degraded by things like Phragmites and purple loosestrife and canary grass, narrow leaf cattail, which is a real threat to the park. Without that, we would lose 
many, if not most, of the, the state listed plants we have now. And even the cluster sand plant community that you would think is secure, once something like Pragmatis gets established around the interior ponds, especially where it occurs, it's gone. And of course, with the emergent marshes, Nearly cattail, hybrid cattail, Phagmites will totally annihilate all the emergent marshes in the park. Without the control of invasives in the park, it wouldn't be a very inviting place to come and visit. And we need to do this for the next generation and the generation after that. Now, I'm taking a class here because um, I've been interested in plants all my life and I've worked in this industry for like the last 15 or 20 years. It's a different setting and I feel that um, you, you meet a wide range of people. We don't, not only have students here but we also have other professional people and this is a great facility. The Regional Science Consortium has over 40 members including colleges and universities, state departments and commissions, local school districts, and professional organizations. Many of the Regional Science Consortium members are conducting field research as part of their education requirements. Jolene Small received her master's degree from Edinburgh University and looked into some of the smallest mammals on the park. It kind of shifted everything. I am doing a basically a population study of small mammal populations and also I am studying the incidence of Lyme disease in white-footed mice on Frasco. Basically what I do is I set up a 50 by 50 grid with 10 meters between each trapping station. Each trapping station contains two traps so there would be a total of 50 traps set up in one trapping session which I normally run for three consecutive nights. I also have to bait them and what I bait them with is a combination of peanut butter and Quaker oats. What I do is I come here early in the morning, I check my traps. If I capture an animal, it's usually a white-footed mouse, I weigh them and then I look at them to see if they are male or female. Then I place a numbered ear tag in their ear so I can keep track of them and how many times I recapture them and I take an ear biopsy from their ear which is placed in a vial of ethanol and then when I get into the lab I will run a PCR analysis on it. Dr. Jeanette Schnars received her PhD from Penn State University and continues to investigate one of the longest lived animals on the park. Well originally the purpose of the research was to start collecting snapping turtles and see if there in fact was a contaminant problem, um, primarily PCBs. And um, we also decided to look into heavy metals such as mercury and arsenic and lead. So even though turtles do have home ranges and they kind of stick around um, to a certain area, their food sources are very mobile and they can bring contaminants from different areas, um, from the lake, from the bay, into the lagoons, and the turtles would um, then consume them and, and acquire them that way. They're very long-lived, but I think we do have to kind of keep in perspective that their population has um, a, lot of, a lot of different things working against it, and maybe we need to um, worry about numbers and and survivorship and make sure because they are a long-lived species and we do see them for a long time we got to make sure the hatchlings um, we got to make sure that we're going to see those in the population as well. In June female snapping turtles emerge from the water to lay their eggs. She selects just the right nesting site, the right temperature and moisture levels. Each clutch can number between 20 and 50 eggs, although one nest site at Presque Isle contains 61 eggs. There is no parental care after the eggs are laid. Once the eggs hatch, it is up to the hatchling to find a home pond. 